put things out there. Like, don't be afraid to put something out there. Don't be afraid for it to fail. Um, we've put out many products that quote unquote failed. Oh my gosh, so many. Hey everyone, I'm Kelsey Heenan and welcome to the very first episode of The First Hour. This show is going to be talking to different experts in their craft and learning how they got to where they are. We're going to talk about their habits, discipline, how they practice and go about their creative processes to be able to be as successful as they are. We're going to talk to people in all different industries from marketing to athletes to actors and everything in between to be able to learn how they started in their very first hour to where they are now, diving into into all of the things that make them incredible. So if you're ready, we're going to get started with talking to Dennis Heenan, who also happens to be my husband and business partner. In today's episode with Dennis, we're going to talk a lot about entrepreneurship and how Dennis got started with our fitness business, Hitburn. So he does a lot of the back end things with internet marketing, email marketing, Facebook advertising, building websites, and everything in between. So if you're interested in entrepreneurship, this is going to be a great episode to listen to. But what's also really cool is we dive deep into his habits, his disciplines, his processes for creativity. So if you just want to be a more creative, productive person, this is going to be incredibly helpful. So make sure you watch all the way through to get all the nuggets of information. Let's get started. Dennis Heenan. What's up? Welcome to the first hour, the first episode of the first hour. Good to be here. It's great to have you. And... I needed to have you as the first guest for so many reasons. The first one is, as you know, today is our 13th wedding anniversary. I know. 13. 13, I can't believe it. That is super crazy. How long does it feel like it's been? Well, I was texting my mom yesterday about um, just catching up and I said it felt about three to five years. I would agree with that. Especially when I look back at pictures though. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I just see how many terrible haircuts I've had over the years and how long it took to grow them out. <laughs> so that's kind of how I measure time now. But I can't believe it's been 13. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you look back on the, yeah, just everything that we've done, it feels like a little bit longer. But um, I mean, I guess it could feel like 13 years if you really go through everything. But still, it's uh, it doesn't, it feels like it's flown by. It really has. And it's just weird to be at a place in life when you categorize things in decades <laughs> you know what I mean? well we celebrated our 10 year in 2020 which mm-hmm. that was a we couldn't really do anything that was a so. huge bummer year clearly but maybe we'll do something super fun this year i mean we're going out oh, to yeah. dinner tonight obviously yeah that'll be good but yeah i cannot believe it's been 13 years do you have one phase of life that you would say is your favorite but so far no, I mean, they're all, all phases of life are different. I mean, everything's been fun. Um, it's been fun to be in different seasons of traveling and, you know, work mode and moving. I've, you know, I've enjoyed moving to different places around the world and around the country. Um, they've all been fun just for different reasons. I know. I, I like them all for different reasons. Certainly some are better than others, mm-hmm. but I do like where we are now. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, kind of sure. fun. Yeah. Fun new chapter. LA's been LA's been good. It's been a good good time. It's been fun being closer to, closer to family. Um, definitely miss some friends. You know, shout out Casey and Dusty in Minnesota, That's Brian funny. in Portland. But yeah, it's still been good. Well, we are here for what we're calling the first hour. This is the first episode that we've ever had, and we got this idea a while ago. This has been a while in the making. And I read the book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers. And one of the things that he talks about in that book is a research study that says it takes 10,000 hours to become a master of a skill. And that kind of sparked something within me where I've always been curious about how people get to where they are. Because there are so many different amazing cool things that you can be about. If you hear clickety clacks, that's Ella. That's Ella's toenails. Whenever we start talking or someone makes a phone call or a FaceTime specifically, Ella gets so excited for some odd reason. And she clicks and those she little baby nails. And she starts running around everywhere. And we just got them trimmed. Mm-hmm. Why she's... She just got a mani pedi. And, and there's her bell. She rang her bell. Does she need to go outside? No, she does not. She okay. has just gone out and went potty. She mm-hmm. is just being annoying. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we get to experience this together. So anyway... 
this this 10,000 hours concept, this research study, I just it just sparked something in me. So I wanted to figure out how do people get to where they are starting with the first hour of their practice. She's hey, wearing it like Ella. eight <laughs> times and I cannot handle her. This, Let's see how many times she rings her bell in this episode. It's been, I think that was four. That was three, I think. Three? Okay, yeah. we'll go with that. Yeah, you need to stop. So starting with the first hour, then you are kind of a jack of all trades. I mean, for those of you who don't know a lot about us, we are husband and wife of 13 years, and we've also run our own business for the last decade, and it's called Hitburn. It's based around high-intensity interval training and fitness, so I do a lot of the coaching. Dennis does the back end. Mm -hmm. You you'll go into all the different things for how you learned how to do that. But I'm really excited to dive into it because not only about the skills that you have and how you learn them, but just kind of your mindset around learning in general is really cool. And I think that people can be inspired by that because sometimes we get a little bit discouraged about trying new things Mm -hmm. and I want to be a lifelong learner. I never want to feel too old to try something new. And so that's why I want to have these conversations. So Dennis, can you explain a little bit about your craft? Which part of it? I mean, I, like you said, I, I like doing a lot of things. Um, growing up, my craft was basketball or sports in general, baseball first, and then basketball. I have a very obsessive personality, as you know. When I get into something, I get very into it. And I think that goes along with learning just because I think when you want to learn something, I think you have to kind of become obsessed with it. So when I was wanting to get better at basketball, as an example, growing up and playing in high school and college, I was obsessed with it. That was my life. Um, obviously you have to figure out how to have balance in life as well. And that's something that I've had to learn. But when it comes to, you know, starting the online side of things back in 2011, 2010, when I started getting, you know, interested in it, I just dove right in and I wanted to learn everything that I could. And I think when you look at people that are great at the things that they do, um, you know, I'll probably use basketball as a reference in a lot of this because we're huge basketball fans. But if you look at someone, you know, all the great players like Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, all those guys, they were obsessed with their craft. They're obsessed with the things that they are doing. When Kobe Bryant retired, he then found something else. He started, you know, he wrote children's books. He had a, you know, certain companies that he ran. He got obsessed in other areas, um, you know, and and certainly he wasn't starting from scratch, but he wasn't starting at the the greatness that he was on the, you know, as he was at a basketball player. So um, I think, you know, having, when you get interested in something, I think it's worthwhile to dive deep and to really try to, you know, become quote unquote obsessed with it um, without losing balance in life as well. Um, cause that's something we've, we've learned along the way. So many times we have learned it. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of questions, even though I know a lot of the answers I'm anticipating what people want to know about this because it really is such a fine line with obsession with mm-hmm. things. It can have a negative connotation, yeah. but it also can be a superpower mm-hmm. if it's harnessed in the right ways. And I'd love to hear you give a little elevator pitch about what our company is, and then we can dive into the nitty gritty of what you do and how you go about your work. Well, when we first originally with the original, you know, starting point of our company in general, I, you know, there's a lot of health and fitness stuff that's out there and our whole goal always was to help what we wanted to simplify it. Like we wanted to simplify it for people. You know, there's, there's so many approaches out there that are very obsessive. And I personally think when it comes to your health and fitness, we always say this, it should be a part of your life. It shouldn't rule your life. And you know, that's something that we've practiced in our own health and fitness. And you know, when, when obviously you, you have your story with that too, when you became overly obsessive in in those things. And so when it comes to that side of things, I think it's teaching balance in that. And I think it's fine when people are really focused on a specific goal, but you need to, like, like I've said, we've learned that balance piece, even though there are periods of time when, you know, when I dove into email marketing, for example, or Facebook ads, I became obsessed with that. That's all I thought about, but I was able to still turn it off. Like I was still able to like 
do normal things in life and go to movies and enjoy, you know, traveling and, and that kind of stuff. And so I think it is, everything is a balance, but, um, in terms of like our company, I think our whole goal is to provide, you know, accessible workouts for people and provide simple solutions that they can just implement into their day. And that's why we attract a lot of people that are like, Hey, I have three days a week to train and I want to do it for 30 minutes. Perfect. Here's a plan. And what is your role within the company? Uh, my role is I basically do everything on the back end, um, all the fun stuff. So what does that mean? Uh, I build websites, advertising, email marketing. Um, I mean, me and you are the idea generators around the social media, um, advertising, uh, videos that we put together. Uh, obviously you do the, the workouts. I can build the workouts within, um, the things that we do build out our app. Um, I mean, basically anything that's on the back end aside from like accounting. Yeah. <laughs> we have an amazing person for that. Yes. So how did you get into this? So I was doing personal training and, um, I was just doing a, I mean, I, I was working at a big, big box gym. And part of the reason, if you're, if you are starting as a, as a personal trainer and you want to get experience, it's one of the best ways to do it. I got to train, you know, anywhere from like 16 year old athletes up to like, I think I had like an 80 year old woman that was my client. So I got to train a wide variety of people. I learned, um, how to create quick, effective workouts. Cause a lot of the sessions that I was doing was were 30 minutes. And so, and they were back to back. So I was doing, you know, 5.00 AM till about 10.00 AM I'd go home, I'd work on online stuff, try to learn, you know, different things about websites and building websites and then marketing. What is email marketing? What, you know, what is a Facebook page? Like basically all the questions that, you know, it was 2012. So I don't think Instagram was around, but, um, yeah, I basically just dove in, in the middle of the day. And then I went back in the evening and trained from like three to eight or three to nine. It was, I mean, they're long days, but, um, yeah, so I, I was doing that. And then I kind of hit this point where I was really, really burned out on personal training and I was finding so much more joy doing the back end, like building websites and coaching on video and figuring things out. Like I've always liked building things and I think it's just like very meditative for me. Like I can build a website and get lost in it for like hours just because I'm having a lot of fun. Um, there's like, you know, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just good. So, so anyways, when I hit that kind of burnout point, I kept a couple clients that I really enjoyed. And then I told you, I was like, Hey, we're going to, I'm going to focus on this online thing and you know, we're going to figure it out. So when you, when you were training, what made you be like, I want to do online fitness because in 2012, that wasn't really a thing. No, I mean, there was a couple of people that were doing it. And a lot of the, the people that I, I was like following that I knew were doing it were, um, they were like, it was, it's called affiliate marketing. I mean, it's still a thing these days, but back then it was like a huge thing. That was like the thing that I, you know, basically that's how you marketed back then. It was either Google ads or basically affiliate marketing were the two things that I kind of saw within the, within the space. And so I was kind of following what they did. And I was like, man, this, I would want to do this. Like I'm confident in how I write my workouts. I've been doing this for a long time. And, and, you know, back in college, I had my own transformation after my freshman year and my strength and conditioning coach, you know, for the next four years, basically taught me everything he knew. And, you know, when he was gone, he allowed me to train the team. So I got like a ton of experience throughout college. I'm, you know, extremely grateful for that. And, and then, you know, as I was starting to train like more general population, I was, you know, became more confident in the way I right workouts and my ability to get people results. And so I was like, man, I want to try to get more people results. And, you know, online is really the space to be able to do that. But like you said, there wasn't really, there wasn't a lot going on at that time in the, in the online world. And then I, I eventually joined a mastermind and met about 50, I think it was like 50 or a hundred people in that group. And we were all just like affiliate marketers essentially. So like I would build a product, write the sales page, you know, uh, and give a commission to people for promoting it. And yeah, that's kind of how we, how we got started. It's interesting too, because the research study that talks about 10,000 hours talks about how intensive practice is important and you need to be practicing for at least 10,000 hours to become a master of the craft. And also it talks about how having great teachers and practicing the right things and guidance along the way is also an important aspect of being able to move those things more quickly. And when, when you were in, you were in different mastermind groups, but you also just dove deep in working with other kind of colleagues who were mm -hmm. paving the way in online fitness and bouncing ideas off of each other and using that as an opportunity to really think differently because it was such a new landscape. And that was something that was so fun to be a part of mm -hmm. is, okay, there's this whole new opportunity of 
internet fitness <laughs> that is just beginning. And here's how a few people are doing it, but what could this next evolution be? And that has been a really cool thing to observe in you where you have a spark of an idea and then you take it to the next level. Well, I think you got to look at what, what, what are people doing well in at, at all times? Like you, like for example, in college, going back to my transformation, like I was 165 pounds after my freshman year and I knew I wanted to gain muscle. I'm six foot six. So that, I'm like, that was, that's very thin. Um, and so after my freshman year, I was like, okay, I need to focus on gaining muscle for my sophomore year of basketball. My strength and conditioning coach at the time was six, six. So my height, but 220 pounds and just like absolutely jacked. So I went up to him. I was like, I want to look like you. Like, I, how do I get, how do I get there? And so we, st I stayed around. I, thankfully I lived close to school and Levi shout out was, um, also there. And so we trained every single day in the summer and he basically showed me how to eat, showed me how to train, showed me how to push my body, you know, and, and I essentially gained 30 pounds of muscle in that one summer. And, you know, obviously that's doesn't happen all the time, but as a beginning lifter, that's something that can happen the following summer, I was able to gain another 15 pounds. And, you know, so I, I learned a ton from him and he, so he was my mentor and he, so he showed me kind of like, the beginning stages of my fitness journey, but same thing in, you know, the, in the mastermind, I was looking around and I was like, okay, these certain people are showing up to these meetings and they're seeing the results. What are they doing? And so I started, I started gravitating more towards them, asking questions, seeing how I could help them. That was always my first thing. Like, Hey, how can I help you first? And, you know, Tyler Bramley is someone that I bring up all the time. He was one of the biggest mentors of mine in the very beginning. I met him in that mastermind. We event, he eventually changed our business in 2016 after the conference we, uh, or the mastermind we did with him. And yeah, so, I mean, I gravitated towards him. I was, I would constantly just, you know, bounce questions off of him and, and all that. And, um, yeah, it's like, he, he saved me a lot of headaches, um, mm -hmm. along the way, just because he was like, no, I mean, I'd, I'd try to focus on this. This is what's working for us. Like, maybe you should try that too. So, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's good to like, obviously, you know, get obsessed with it, but also having a mentor to, to show you like, Hey, this isn't probably not the best thing to do. Like if I had to go train on in fitness by myself that first summer, I would have been clueless. It's easy to practice the wrong things mm -hmm. or just not make the most of your time without some guidance. And that, that mastermind with Tyler was such an amazing pivotal point yeah. that even to this day, years and years later, we still go back to those moments and those lessons that we learned. Mm -hmm. Can you tell a little bit about some of that experience? Yeah. So in 20, I think it was 2016, wasn't it? I, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it was 2016. We, you know, we, we were at a place in our business, we were starting to grow a little bit more and we are just starting to branch out and starting to do Facebook ads and growing our Facebook page and, and things like that. And, you know, one of, one of the things that we were always talking about was like, what if the affiliate world kind of like shut down, what would we do? And at that time there was no answer for us. So that's when we started branching out into other options to be like, Hey, we want to run Facebook ads. We want to start figuring out how to drive our own traffic. So if that does ever shut down, we can literally just move into something else and like have Facebook have more avenues of traffic. And so anyways, we went to Tyler's mastermind. There was, uh, five other businesses there and then us. And the first question that Tyler asked was, Hey, what is the goal that you want to achieve in your business? And so all of the five, uh, businesses before us that went, they were like, we want to do $50 million and we want to have this huge company. We want to have a hundred million dollar company and have this massive company and blah, blah, blah. And finally it got to us and we were like, Oh my gosh, like these companies just said they want to do 50 to hundred million dollars. And Tyler looked at us and was like, what do you want to achieve? And he already knew what we wanted to achieve because we wrote it down and we were like, we want a lifestyle business. That was what we said. And he was like, perfect. And so anyways, that was like a huge changing point for us because it's like, it's so easy to look at these other companies and, you know, be like, okay, well, if that's what they want, okay. Yeah. We want to do $50 million per year too, but it's like, that's not what we wanted. We wanted to be able to travel and have flexibility to do other things that we like. Um, we didn't want to have this massive team. Like we wanted to run a lifestyle business and that's where we're still at today, which is what we want to do. We're doing the things that we want to do. And, um, we've gone through different phases where it's like, we've grown to a point where we're like, this isn't enjoyable. And so we scaled back and all that. But, um, you know, the turning point for us that weekend, not only with that, but Tyler's brought it in his ad guy and he looked at our ads and he said, um, uh, he looked at our ads and, and he goes, why are you guys not spending 10 times more than you're spending right now? 
And I was like, I don't know, because that'd be a lot of money. I think we were mm -hmm. spending like maybe a hundred to two hundred dollars a day at that point. So in my mind, I'm like, this guy wants me to spend a thousand to two thousand dollars a day on Facebook. And uh, when he said that, though, he's like, you guys can easily scale to that, and within a month, probably, I think we were scaled past that um, on Facebook. It it was interesting because we didn't have the experience or the confidence mm -hmm. at the time mm -hmm. to take the next step. And because we were so grassroots, we didn't take funding. We kind of just, any dollar we made, we put it back into the business. It's a scary thing yeah. when you are learning how to run a business, when you're learning how to do something that is not really something that exists and <laughs> hasn't existed for a long time. And so having them speak that to us was really helpful and a really important coaching tip to be able to say, okay, we can have the confidence to go out a little bit outside of our comfort zone, calculated risks. I mean, the numbers were there, so it yeah. made sense. We weren't just throwing money at the air, but that was a really interesting and pivotal point and something that we always come back to. Cause like you said, there are so many different phases that you can go through in life, in business mm -hmm. and shiny objects, they'll always be shiny and distracting, always. right? But it's it's really cool to be able to ebb and flow and then always come back to that center of mm -hmm. what you want, whatever it may be. Yeah. So you wear so many hats in this business in the back end. So you mentioned you do Facebook ads, you build websites and you do email marketing. We do a lot of the brainstorming together mm -hmm. for copy ideas, but then you mostly write the copy. You, you basically do it all <laughs> and it's cool because you are self-taught in the sense that you have really just dove into this and, and learned along the way. Let's talk about email marketing because I think that that is, you have so many great skills, but I would say that's one of your top skills. When you are going to write an email, what are some of the things that go through your head for how you go about this? Like, I'd love to hear more about your routines, your idea generation, all of those different things that go into email. Yeah, I mean, I'm always thinking of in headlines. I've I've done this basically basically since 2012. Like the the importance of headlines was kind of one of the things that I was taught early on. Whether it's a headline on a on a page or um, a headline, because when we first started, it was long form copy, and a lot of that stuff still works. And if you don't hook someone in with that first big headline, you're not gonna you're not gonna hook them. That's like you know a large percentage of, of the sales page, when you see a page that is 10,000 words or 5,000 words, I remember you remember some of ours, it's the, the first headline that hooks them in. And then it's a lot of times people scroll straight, straight down to the price. So it's almost like a two step decision. Oftentimes when people read the full thing, like, yes, they'll, they'll do that, but it, those headlines are so important. So whenever I come up with a good headline in my, in my head, I always have, like, I just have a section of notes in my phone where it's just headline ideas. Um, when it comes to email, you have to think in steps. So we, we always talk about this, um, you know, when we're doing presentations, like thinking of in steps in terms of like, um, the first thing someone is going to see in your email is what the subject line. So the, the subject line is what gets them to open the email. If, if they don't open the email there, there's no chance they're going to click the link. There's no chance they're going to purchase. There's no chance they're going to respond to the email. There's no chance they're going to take that next action action step. So the, the subject line or the headline is the most important thing in my, in my, in my opinion, just because it gets them to open the email. Um, I feel like my subject lines are very strong just because I, have always the, the question I'm always asking is if I sent this email to a friend, what would my subject line be? So that's why oftentimes my subject lines are coffee on me or want to get pizza or Hey, with a smiley face, like things that I would send to Brian or, you know, Ed or, or anything like that. And, um, so I think that gets them to open the email. And then obviously the email copy is, is important too. And you know, that opening line is, is usually what can draw them in and, um, and all that. And so that's kind of how, how I think about, um, email is, is one that the headline, the subject line to get them to open. And then what's the goal of the email. So there's, there's many goals that an email can serve are, you know, and you have to have that in mind. Are you trying to drive as many clicks as you can to a certain sales page or a video, or, you know, what action are you trying to get them to take? Do you want them to respond to the email? 
to get, you know, get them to respond, to start a conversation, to maybe book a coaching call or just have a conversation through email to then purchase a program. Um, you know, is it a content email? Do you want them to spend a long period of time reading that email, um, you know, to increase your deliverability or, you know, responding to an email increases deliverability. There's a lot of things that, um, you know, go into email, but the whole, the whole thing is like, what's the point of the email? Oftentimes when, um, people are like, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, I, my goal is to sell this program. And I'm like, well, you just wrote a 2000 word email and the link was in the PS, like you're not going to sell a lot of programs. You might convert on the people that do click that link. But if you want to, if your goal is to drive as many people as you can to the sales page, then that email isn't it. You need a short email, like real punchy, just boom, click this link and you're, and you send them there. What I'm hearing is persuasion and connection mm -hmm. because even if you aren't in email marketing, it, it doesn't matter. It's an understanding that being able to persuade people and connect with them can make a big difference in so many different areas. And you do a really good job of that because you make it so personal. You mm. do a ton of storytelling, but you can't get there if you don't get them in the door. Mm. And I think it's so interesting because of what you do with writing so many headlines. I'm so cognizant when I am going through my emails and some company sends me an email and I click it, I go back and think, okay, why? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why did I click that? What was interesting about that to me? Because we're, persuasion isn't a negative thing. No. It's important and it can be a manipulative thing if people mm -hmm. have that type of mindset, but it's, it's really beneficial if you have something that will change their lives on the other end. And that's something that you're so good at. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think everyone who's listening, who is a marketer, I think if you ever get stopped by an ad, if you ever open an email, why ask yourself that question? I send you ads all the time yeah. that are either like, Hey, this was eye catching. Hey, this was a, a good idea. Hey, this was a gro great opening line. Hey, this was great copy. Um, and it's, you have to be studying that constantly. And just, you know, when I do the same thing, why did I open this email? Like, I'm not just like scrolling, you know, I'm, people get t tens, if not hundreds of emails every day from different companies, from different people. And so you're competing for them to open your email and spend some time with it. And then if you can get them to click, like that's, or get them to click or respond or whatever, again, whatever action you want them to take. I think it's one of those things where you have to be asking yourself constantly, like, why did I open this email? And you know, for, for me as a marketer, my, my biggest, like one of the biggest compliments that I've, that I get from people is when like our customer service team or like people out like that we've seen, um, you know, they'll be like responding to the email as though I sent it to that singular person. And you know, your email list is any, you know, can be hundreds of thousands, million, it can be that many people on it, but it's like when they respond thinking that you sent them that email to them specifically, you did your job because that's how you want it to feel. You want it to feel like you're reaching out to Jessica in Minnesota who is struggling with X, Y, Z, and you're providing a solution and you're telling a story or a success story from a client, whatever it is. And they feel like, oh my gosh, Kelsey is reaching out to me today to, t to share this. I want to, I want to work with her, you know? Um, yeah. How do you make them feel that way? What are, do you have any examples or strategies or things that you go back to? I mean, you, you have to, you know, build the relationship. And I think that comes from, you know, multiple touch points. So it's like, mm -hmm. if someone sees you on Instagram and then they're on your email list. And if for those listening, if you don't have an email list, I mean that we, we say this whenever we speak, get an email list, like start building it, drive people from your Instagram, from your Facebook, from your YouTube, from everywhere, get them on your email. Because when things change on Facebook or Instagram, when Instagram changes their algorithm and their, the stats tank and all that stuff, you have them on your email list. And so I think it's touch points along the way. So when someone's following you on Instagram, they see your videos, they see your stories and then boom, they're on your email list. Now that they're on your email list and your Instagram. And then when you send an email out to them and you send promoting a YouTube video, now they're on your YouTube channel. They're subscribed to three different spots, you know? So it's like you have multiple touch points all, all over. And so you kind of build that relationship with them. And I think honestly, we, you know, we kind of go back to our rules of like, 90% of our emails, we're providing some sort of value or content that people can walk away with, whether they purchase something or not. We've always kind of said this, we want, we want to provide value. We want to help people, whether they're, you know, purchasing a product or, you know, we're recommending something else. And, you know, for us, it's, 
uh, you know, the other 10% of emails is just straight up sell. Like we sell and we sell hard and because we're providing value in those 90%. So when someone opens that email, it's like, maybe we're providing a workout, but we're also providing an option to join our app. Maybe we're giving them, you know, a recipe or we're providing them encouragement. And then we're also giving them an option to join our app or join coaching or, or do whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a balance. So it's you know every email kind of ask yourself like, is this providing value? Or am I building my no like trust factor? And then on the ten percent of emails that you're sending that are selling and selling hard, understand that you're providing value ninety percent of the time. Like that's a lot of value that you're providing. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's kind of a just finding that balance. You do such a good job of that, of making sure that people are taken care of in having different ways that they can feel supported in their health and fitness through email, but then also giving them opportunities to change their life through the different products and services that we have. Mm -hmm. And you, like we were talking about, connect with people. You are so great at getting people in the door with these catchy headlines. Mm -hmm. And something that I admire so much in you is that these skills translate into so many other areas. You have some of the most fun and unique hobbies. Ella just took off her flight. So She's going to ring her bell, guaranteed. She 100% is. Okay, she stopped. Yeah, she's, she's, knows she's talk, she knows we're talking about she her. She knows that. Oh, my gosh. So, anyway, these you you have translated your personality and your way of learning into so many other things. So we're talking about the the power of your copywriting and emails, but you also translate that into creative writing and you mm -hmm. are working on several novel ideas, which is so cool because you're always waking up in the morning and being like, I have this amazing idea for a book. And I'm sure your notes app is filled with a gazillion different headlines and book ideas yep. and all these different things. How would you say the way that you're wired or how you practice skills translates into other areas? I just think I, I get ideas a lot throughout the day and I just like writing them down. And so some of them I will never do. I just write it down. It's like whether I get like a book title idea or, you know, something like that. And, you know, some ideas come to me and I'm like, I won't ever do with anything with this, but I don't know. I'll write it down for, the future or if someone says something that sparks it, it's like, Oh, I have this idea. Here you go. Um, but I also, I mean, I, I have a lot of, a lot of other interests. Like, I, you know, I like health and fitness and you know, the email marketing and there's there the bell, is. um, and email marketing and, and all of that stuff. And I, I do, you know, I've always, like I said, I enjoyed building things as soon as I kind of built my first website and, and tried to figure out the back end of things. And, um, you know, all of that stuff, I, I, very much enjoyed that process. And I think when you look at the other things that I'm interested in and, you know, all of that, I, I think I like the beginning stages of a lot of stuff. And I don't know if it was, you know, my story growing up, like I, you know, I mean, you know, this, I played ba uh, basketball and baseball growing up. Those were like my two main sports. And then I stopped playing basketball and only played baseball for like two and a half, three years. And then in high school, I was like super burned out on baseball. So I only focused on basketball. So I was kind of felt like a beginner again in, in the basketball sense. And I just like spent hours and hours and hours every day, like shooting and trying to get better and all that stuff. And, um, so I think that's one thing that does excitement is like, excite me is, you know, even like learning to draw or to write a novel or something like that. Like it's, it's hard, but I think you have to have you have to like remind yourself, like, it's okay to be a beginner in these things. And I mean, you always say to me like, yeah, but your drawings are good. And I'm like, no, they're not like, I don't, I don't think like I want to improve upon them, you know? And, um, so I, I, I don't know. I think I like the, the beginning aspects of things that try to improve and see what I can achieve in a year or two years or whatever it is. Which is so admirable. You are so admirable because a lot of people, don't start and don't try things. They don't even write the ideas down in their notes app because it's not practical. When are they ever going to get to it? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you not only write these ideas down, but you, you try them. And sometimes an interest maybe lasts for a day. Maybe it's a couple of weeks, a couple of months, mm -hmm. but you've picked up some super cool things. Like you're writing, you're drawing, you're super into Legos and have our, our house is filled with Legos. <laughs> So I like building stuff. I told you. Yeah. And, and that's, that's something that I personally always want to carry with me is the idea that 
it's okay to be a beginner. And like you brought up Kobe before, I mean, he probably hadn't written a children's book before Mm -hmm. after he retired. Right. So, but still it's, it's, the way that he goes about learning and the way that he goes about hard work that makes him successful. And obviously he was Kobe and (laughs) so that helped. Well, I think, I mean, it goes back to the, the beginning, you know, conversation of like when, if you do have an idea and you are passionate about it, I think you have to have some level of obsession and that doesn't mean that's like all you do. And that's all you think about because there's different levels of obsession. It's like, you don't need to be a 10 out of 10. Um, but it's like, if you want to learn to draw, you need to, you need to like either, you know, take a class or start drawing on the daily or, you know, you have to become, you can't just like, oh, I'm going to draw one photo and then not draw for three weeks and then, you know, do that. Or like write a, writing a, a book. I'm like, if you want to write a, a novel, like I am like in the moment, I'm, I'm always thinking about it. Like, okay, what, what, what's happening in this next chapter? What's happening? And, you know, and I'm creating this outline. So I kind of know what's next. But as you know, I've, I'm, I've been changing things the last couple of weeks and, um, just because things pop up and I'm like, okay, this didn't make sense here. This doesn't make sense here. And so, but along with that, I'm still able to get other things done. Like I'm still working and doing hipper and stuff, but I'm, but I'm thinking more about that. And, you know, a lot of people are teach different things. I, I, I like having a lot of interests. So many people out there are like, you know, you need to focus only on your business and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, okay. That doesn't sound fun. <laughs> I agree. And because I think it's, I think you're, you're talking about like focus Mm -hmm. and intensive practice and you don't have to have only one thing because I felt that way in my life where it's like, oh, I can only have this one thing that I can be practicing and learning and doing. And that kind of takes over my entire identity. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to get burned out. Yeah, certainly it, it can fast track you in certain ways. But think about if, if you're an athlete, I mean, we were both athletes, if an injury happens or once you graduate from Mm -hmm. college, or if someone's in the pros, once they're done at the pros, if that's the only thing that you are interested in and have been doing, that's a really tragic feeling. Well, I mean, we both kind of, well, I mean, me more so than you went through it post-college. Yeah. Once we were done playing, it's like, oh my gosh. I mean, I know we were, we were both young, um, but it's still, it's a weird thing when you're like, basketball was my life and now it's over. Now what? Mm -hmm. And that's like the only thing that you, you kind of, we kind of had, um, up to that point, like we were both like, I mean, we were both like very obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. So it's like over the years and when we've experienced this in our business too. And like I said, that's why we've learned this along the way. It's like when we've be, when we were so obsessed with our business, business was everything. It's like at some point we hit burnout. It wasn't fun. It's, you know, we didn't want to do it anymore. And that's when you kind of have to take a step back and and be like, okay, I need us. I need some other interests like, you know, and, and I think we've hit us, we've striked a good balance with, with that now. Yeah. Because there are so many cool things out there. And the more I explore other things Mm -hmm. that I maybe had preconceived notions about, and then I learn more about it. I'm like, oh, that's actually super cool. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Like for sure. It's, it's easy to judge certain things and be like, Oh no, that's not practical. Or I don't have time for that. Or that's, you know, nerdy or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But if you're interested in it and want to explore it, I think there's something incredibly valuable to that. And you do such a good job of that. Well, I mean, we've, um, you know, I think opening up your interests can help you in business as well. It gives you other ideas. We're targeted by, I mean, in the past we were only targeted by fitness stuff because that's all we ever were doing. Now we're targeted by like, I'm targeted by drawing stuff all the time or comics or Lego or, you know, um, basically everything. And it's like, I'm now seeing, oh, wow, there's like, this is a great idea. This is a great idea. This is cool. I could use this, like add topic or add idea and translate it into fitness. You know, like there's, um, expanding your interests, like helps in the areas that you want to grow as well. So it helps your business. Um, and also too, it's like, I mean, yeah, just going out and like meeting other people that are in other industries. Like we go to Comic-Con and dress up and it's awesome. And we would have never done that, you know, eight, 10 years ago, but it's super fun. You meet a ton of great people and yeah, it's like, th- those are like some of the most fun weekends. It's so fun. And I definitely feel not only more refreshed because I'm having mm-hmm. fun, but I feel way more creative because of it. Yeah. And that in itself is motivating for entrepreneurship Yeah, because it sparks something within you to want to create something new. Yeah, totally. 
So you're a rock star at like all of these things, right? We all know I that. I don't take compliments well. I know. And that's something that you're going to be practicing. And with that, what's one skill that you don't have that you think would be really fun to learn? Um, in this, like as of now, um, I mean, you've seen our comic drawing wall. I think, I think the, the amount of skill that people have when it comes to the artistic ability to draw and do all that is like mind blowing to me. And when, when I, you know, the more I learn about it, I'm like, man, this is like, you have the person that does like the sketch and then you have the person that does the inking and then you have the person that does the colors. And then, you know, then it comes and is this beautiful piece of art. That's like unbelievable to me. And that's something that I've like, you know, that's why I've drawing more just, I mean, one, it's, it's fun. It's relaxing. Um, but like that skill alone is like so freaking cool to me. Who are you going to draw next? Well, you said storm. That, that was pretty fun. I was pretty, pretty proud of that until I put it up against, uh, <laughs> okay. I just got to say <laughs> it's so good and I'm not pumping you up. Like I am, but I'm not telling you that it's good for no reason because it's, it's super good. I mean, you just started drawing. And so, so the story with that is we have this gallery of superheroes in our hallway upstairs and we have this kind of quadrant of, of four air of four painting or four sketches yeah, slash sketches. inking, whatever. And there was one that wasn't filled in and we had looked at different artists trying to figure out who we wanted to commission mm -hmm. for that space. And Dennis comes to me a couple of weeks ago and he's like, you know what? I'm going to take that. And so you, in, in two days, you come up with this amazing vision for storm and she's dope. Like she's, well, thank you. Uh, yeah. She's, she's wearing a mohawk. She's super strong. Yep. Cool pose. Maybe we'll show a clip of it on here. It's it's super if cool. You're lucky. If I'm lucky. So yeah, I mean that's that's one of the things that is just so cool. You you've just started, but you're already seeing so much improvements, and it's inspiring to me to be able to think, okay, what are all these things that I want to do that I just am putting aside because I'm too scared, or it's not practical, or it's you know not adding dollars to the bottom line right now. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we live in a world where it's like, if you're not making money with it, you don't want to do it. And it's like, okay, but if you're having fun with it, why not? You never know. And, and you never know what's going to come from it either. You know, like, I mean, we've met people at, um, you know, Comic-Con conventions that get paid to dress up and get paid to go to premieres and get paid to go do photo shoots. It's like, they literally just went to a Comic-Con and started dressing up as certain characters and then now make a living doing that. Or like make a living building costumes for other people. Like, you know, I don't know if they thought they were going to be making money with that originally, but it's like when you do follow your passion, you know, a lot of people out here are probably listening that want to start a business or something like that. And I mean, go for it. Like, like we've, we've talked about, like, you know, we said take calculated risks. And so I'm not saying like quit your day job immediately and start, you know, trying to do it, but it's like, start working on a couple hours after work every day or in the morning. And then as you start growing, maybe like go to halftime for your job as you start like seeing some income or, or whatever it is, it's like take those next steps, but also you have to be patient with it too. And I think you do need to become obsessed with it on a certain level. And I mean, you remember when I had the, like when I first started, I was doing personal training, I was doing that internship. I didn't do anything at that internship aside <laughs> from learn online stuff. Like I wasn't doing a sorry to I can't I can't remember what the it was it was, was a marketing yeah, it was thing a, it was nonprofit but I was reading so you were learning marketing but it just wasn't for that company no not at all <laughs> I was reading online books about how to build an online business but um it's like you know don't don't do that but um <laughs> do it if you want I don't care um <laughs> you've got no skin in that game yeah um no but it's like yeah I, I I was obsessed with learning all of that stuff and so I'd learn it every chance that I could and um you know, and then, you know, obviously you have to put it into action too. And we talk about this all the time as well Is like, we have to test things. You have to put things out there. Like, don't be afraid to put something out there. 
Don't be afraid for it to fail. Um, we've put out many products that quote unquote failed. Oh my gosh, but, so many. Yeah, I mean, I just saw a clip of, um, I think it was Ed Sheeran today and he, he played a clip of his of him when he was like singing at 16 and he, he was horrible, like wow. really bad. And he, I mean, he said this himself, like there's, yeah. a, there's a clip, um, he was doing an interview and he was, he basically said, you don't learn from success, you learn from your failures. And he's like, I failed over and over and over and over. And then at, I think he said at 20, four years later or something like that, he released his, his like album that um, took off. Wow. I'm like, that's unbelievable. I love seeing examples like that because I myself have had experiences where I look back at some of the first fitness videos that I did and it's, it's, it's not good. <laughs> it's really not good. And it's, it's easy to want to be so perfect. Like I am such, I'm so guilty of this, like mm -hmm. wanting to be perfect from the get go yeah. and wanting to be an expert and all these things. But it, it's such an evolution over time and it takes so much practice to be able to get to the point where you not only feel more confident in it, but you really learn from it. Like mm -hmm. you said, failures teach you how to succeed. Yeah. Don't you remember the videos that Levi and I did? What they're, were the, they're still online. What the ones the at Vanguard. Wait, what were those? Oh my gosh. They're, they're real bad. Like, they're great workouts. Were if they you ever fitness want. videos? Yeah. They're the ones done at Vanguard. Yeah, I would love to see those because I'm sure they're oh, they're, I'm sure they're epic in one way or another. No, they are. The workouts are absolutely insane. Like some of the stuff that we used to do, I'm like, I don't know how we did that. But um we were not great on camera. I mean, thinking about you you've been such a great coach for me mm -hmm. in the process where uh you you've kind of been my my media trainer in a sense mm -hmm. because when I first started coaching on camera, I'm very shy and very soft-spoken. And I was pretty freaking boring and awkward and robotic. And there were so many times that we would riff back and forth and you'd be like, you, you gotta, you gotta have more energy, more energy, more energy. And at first I was kind of like, how dare you give me this feedback? But after a while I learned to not be, you, you were never rude or mean or anything, but it was eventually I realized, oh, this isn't a personal thing. He's not saying that I'm like the worst person in the world, but there are ways that I can prove at my job. And it has made such a big difference over time. I, I always feel like I could do more. I could say things differently. There are so many things that I could add different type of energy, more energy. But at the same time, like if I think about where I started, I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, yeah, it's like, it's practice and getting, getting that in, you know, that feedback instantly helps. I think, you know, you have to watch your, your videos back and it's, you can't, you know, you have to critique what you're doing. Like when you're, when you're on camera, you have to act like you have to, act, I mean, what's the, what like six times or 10 times more excited than you think that you are because on camera, it translates very differently. Like if I were to just like, be like, hi, I'm Dennis, like, how's it going? and looking at the camera, it's like, Hey, I'm Dennis, what's going on? Like that to me seems like I'm way more excited on the camera. It's probably not even gonna look that excited right? because you have to be more, more, you have to bring the energy. Mm -hmm. Like you have to bring the energy from yourself through the camera to the viewer. Yes. So, and I think about the difference too, because I like just by nature, like I'm a very chill person. Mm -hmm. Right. But on camera, I need to, especially when I'm teaching someone how to do the workout, like I need to help them feel excited and energized, but how I'm, how I am on camera is so different from how I train in person. If I mm -hmm. were to go to someone's house <laughs> at seven in the morning and be all excited and whatever, they would be like, y'all can leave mm -hmm. because it's, it's just too much. So understanding, uh, kind of your audience in that moment yeah. is really important. And, yeah. and you've been a, a great coach for me in that sense. Uh, and it's cool to hear that Ed Sheeran has gone through that same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, Dennis, we've talked about a lot of the different skills that you have and how that translates not only into internet marketing, into copywriting, but some of your other interests and skills and all the different things. If someone were to start their first hour in internet marketing or wanting to start their own business, what would you tell them to do? That's a tough question. I mean, one to not be afraid to start it. That's the, I think that's the first thing that holds a lot of people back. Like, don't be afraid to start and fail. 
or quote unquote fail. Um, and then become obsessed with it, like become obsessed with learning everything you possibly can about it, but not just learning, taking action on the things that you're learning. And I think it's important to, if you can find a good coach to help you in the beginning, because that, that will eliminate a lot of mistakes and that will eliminate a lot of headaches. And, you know, using, using an, a simple example, like I, you know, we have people all the time come up to us and are like, Hey, what is, you know, I got, I just got a quote for this website. It's going to be a two page website. The quote was $8,500. Is that good? I'm like, dude, I could build that website in like 30 minutes because there's plugins out there that there's, you know, easy website builders and things like that. So when you look into things and you start learning this stuff, you realize like, oh, there's a lot of things that I can really do quickly and easily. And there's templates out there and like, there's all this stuff, but you don't learn that stuff unless you become obsessed with things and start looking into stuff. And, um, you know, one thing I will say is, is don't let quote, I'm learning, hold you back from taking action because taking action and getting things out there and testing and, you know, all of that is the most important part. And that's how, that's how you're going to learn. And so I think, you know, even for us, like, yes, we are learning in that process of build, how to build sales pages, how to build websites, how to do email marketing, but we are also putting products together for our, for our users and, and contacting other affiliates to promote our stuff, even though it wasn't perfect. And I think, you know, so don't let perfection hold you back. Like an example for us is the first product I built took me six months. I think I sold, we sold like what, five copies or something. Yeah. And I was like, man, that was a lot of time that I spe spent building that product for five sales that we sold, I think for like $40. And it was all because I thought I needed to make the product perfect. And at the end of the day, your products are going to be good if you're confident in what you do, but know that you can always change things. Like we're always improving our products. Even if we sell a product and you know, someone points something out and we're like, Hey, we can make an improvement here. We make that improvement and everyone gets the update. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, if you're, if you're just starting out, like go for it, like start learning, you know, everything that you can take action on the things that you're learning. Um, you know, in this day and age, you can, you know, you have your Instagram, you have your YouTube, um, you know, start building your email list off of those, you know, be consistent in how you're posting, look at what other people are doing and be like, okay, why is this working for them? And see if that's one, the type of content style you want to be going with. Like, do you want to do the tweet posts or do you want to do reels or swipe videos or whatever it is, do the things that you want to do and in your own voice and in, you know, be creative in what you're doing. Um, don't just like copy everyone else, like do you like go and do the things that may bring you joy, the ideas that you have start writing down your ideas, because when you start becoming, becoming obsessed with things, you're going to start, like someone's going to say something and you're going to be like, that's what I'm going to do for my next post. That thing that she just said. And the example for that is like in that, the dressing room at Nordstrom, like, you know, yeah. when the woman said that thing and you overheard it and I was like, yeah, that's a great post idea. So for context, a few years ago, I was in a dressing room at Nordstrom and I was trying on my clothes and in the next uh, room over, I overheard these two girls talking and one of the girls said, I got way too fat to wear this. And immediately my heart broke in a million pieces because I have been there. I know what that thought feels like and it's just tragic that other people would have to experience that. And so that thought, like you said, it kind of was a light bulb moment of, hey, I need to create uh, a teaching moment mm -hmm. about this for other people because how many other people have felt that and experienced those types of feelings? Yeah, and I think when you when you think about the space that you're in, like we're in the fitness space, like what are people struggling with? Like you have clients, you know, what are they talking about? What are the things that they're saying to you? You can use those ideas as posts, as emails, as all this stuff if you're in a different space. Like for me, when people are like, hey, I'm thinking about building this app, it's gonna cost me $150,000. And I'm like, well, you could get two pieces of software and do it for 500. And then once you build your user base, then you could do a customized app. And like, you know, that's a possibility. And mm -hmm. in the, the day and age we live in, like, I mean, we use two pieces of software to build our app. Our app looks fantastic. And it's like, you know, you can start that same process for probably 500 bucks 
Whereas a custom built app is 125 grand. I remember we got the first quote, this was back, you know, years ago, but I was like, man, that's a big test to spend $125,000 on an app. <laughs> we don't even know if the, like people have been asking for it, but it's different when you're asking them to pay out, you know, pay a monthly fee for it. So, um, yeah, just, um, you know, so in that space, I'm like, you know, if I'm in the app space that, you know, VidApp is the, is the company, I'm like, that's my message. You're hearing people sell these quotes for X amount of dollars. And you're like, well, you could just start with us and mm -hmm. spend 500 or whatever their cost is. Yeah. Whatever it is. And getting started is such a important message because I know I have experienced things where it's taken me way longer to get started. I mean, even this, mm -hmm. right? Like I, you, it's, it's hard to push yourself to start putting things out there yeah. and Certainly that kind of goes into, okay, how do you define uh, success? How do you define mastery? Because there are certain things where you definitely should not wait 10,000 hours <laughs> to start getting out there no. and, and things like that. But also there are certain things where it's like being qualified mm -hmm. is important. So yep. if you are, if you are, I want my doctor to <laughs> really know what they're doing yeah. right versus like you were talking about art art is so much more subjective mm -hmm. in in all of that so depending on what you're wanting to start in i mean look, doctors do internships and all these different things where they get all this practice and have great teachers but if you're an artist start creating and let people see the journey it's such a cool thing for people to be a part of and it like we were talking about before it creates so much more connection yeah i mean i'm following an artist right now who just started out i mean he's probably been you know going at it for a year or two and if you looked at his stuff compared to some of like the quote unquote professional artists you can you can see there's areas that he's working on but he's putting his stuff out there like he's getting it out there he's asking for feedback and he's he's already done a couple commissions because people like the way that he does his certain style and it's like if he was just you know staying behind the scenes like he he would never have gotten those opportunities and yeah so it's like it's get your stuff like put your stuff out there like who cares get it out there and something that I like to say in that to like encourage people to get outside of their comfort zone and get out there is you never know who's watching, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like, especially in the world of social media and, and that being certainly there are downfalls, but it can also be an incredible tool for connection. There have been a couple opportunities that I would have never had mm -hmm. if I hadn't put my story out there, if yeah. I hadn't given ideas for workouts that helped inspire people. And I'm super grateful because yeah, it feels scary at first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People are going to say negative things periodically, but if you work hard, if you put out great things and if you continue to learn and have the best interests of others, yeah. it's really amazing to see what you can come up with. For sure. Dennis, you're amazing. And you know that we not only are business partners and best friends, we have been married for a long time. 13 years. 13 today. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anything else you want to add before we take off? Um, no. I think Ella rang her bell nine times. I mean, it was at least six, and I'm not going to lie, it was pretty obnoxious, but we moved through it. <laughs> Dennis, where can people find you? Um, on Instagram, I'm Denheen. I don't post a lot. It's D N H E E N. Um, maybe if you're lucky, I'll start posting more. Uh, no, Hipburn is our main hip fitness account. So it's H I I T B U R N. You can find us on Instagram, hip or uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all the same. Um, and then the Daily Kelsey is where you can also find me. I'll probably be on there today for our anniversary. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> You're amazing, and I love you. Love you too. All right. Thank you so much for joining our first episode of the first hour. We have a ton of incredible guests that are going to be coming up next people in all different industries. So this one was obviously Dennis, my husband and business partner. And we talked a lot about marketing, but we have people in TV. We have actors from shows, from movies, in sports, athletes. We have so many different types of people who are going to be on the show and really just trying to get origin stories, learn how these people learn, how they practice, how they got to where they are, and just learn more about their creative process, their discipline, so many different things along the way. So if you liked this episode, if you want to see more, please hit subscribe and like, and feel free to leave a comment. And if there are any certain guests that you'd like to see, please let me know. We'll see you next time.